Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ibuka Nwiki. Um, I'm a postdoc at UCLA, and I'm here today to talk to you about not the big one, but some good ones in relation to the Ridgecrest earthquake that occurred uh, back in Independence Day last year. So as geotechs, typically we have a couple of stripes to earn. Uh, first is to make sure your field boots uh, have some wear and tear, maybe some dry mud stains. Um, the other is to make sure you bring, you know, some donuts for your driller in the morning so that maybe um, the day goes by better and maybe you get better data than expected. Um, typically, um, for us who do a lot of seismic related work, you know, the stripes to earn typically fall along the lines of uh, what earthquake have you experienced? Now, I'm not talking about like a magnitude three or four, nobody wakes up for those. Uh, I'm talking about magnitude six and above. Now, I know some of you like this guy's kind of ridiculous, but that's just kind of how I see it. Um, now, I'm not going to compare myself to people who chase tornadoes and say, I'm like, I'm an earthquake chaser. No, 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 no. I just want to feel a good earthquake, which I haven't yet, uh, under controlled conditions, you know, maybe shaking in an open field or possibly in a parking lot with nothing above me. But some of us, and by some of us, I mean me, are not so lucky. So oh, that short clip without the noise was for, on purpose, and that was uh, uh, the, the magnitude 7.1 earthquake uh, that occurred um, on the 5th of July, and it was a 50 kilometer right lateral strike script rupture. Uh, most of it occurred within the Navy base, uh, some of it outside, uh, but that was kind of what happened. And then that was the second of two events. The first event was a magnitude 6.4 that occurred the day before on 4th of July, which is 17 kilometer long left lateral strike strip rupture. So, while I wasn't there in person, unfortunately, for the shaking, um, I was there the following day for, to join the GEAR team uh, in their reconnaissance efforts. Uh, for those who don't know, GEAR is the Geotechnical Extreme Earth, uh, Event Reconnaissance, and it was through this opportunity that I got to experience and participate in my first reconnaissance, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, now, GEAR is an NSF, for those who don't know, GEAR is an NSF-sponsored post-disaster initiative that mobilizes a group of uh, volunteer geoscientists and engineers to conduct detailed uh, reconnaissance, which involves uh, documenting ob observations and collecting perishable data. For the GEAR team that went to the uh, Ridgecrest earthquake, it involves uh, the group, uh, primarily the UCLA Earthquake Engineering Group, uh, that includes a few people, including myself, uh, and a bunch of other different in institutions, UNR, uh, ASU, Fullerton, Irvine, and then some people from USGS and the city organization is SCEC. We also had some collabor collaboration with those who went into the base because um, we didn't have access, uh, um, uh, which was CGS, USGS, and the Navy themselves, and pg &E. And then we had a UAV team that did a lot of uh, drone imaging and surveys that came the, the day of and, the day, and a couple days later. So when I say perishable data, I'm talking about uh, offsets and surface fault ruptures that given a short amount of time um, could be disrupted by humans or nature. Um, in fact, um, there was where the, the two events crossed a couple of infrastructure, particularly the, the California 178 and the train tracks that's a little bit south of that and caused some damage. Uh, but the thing is these damages were quickly repaired, so if you weren't there fast enough, you wouldn't be able to capture some of the stuff that we were able to gather with the surface fault rupture stuff. So because the gear team got there on time, we were able to gather uh, controlled ground control measurements and supplement that with um, drone surveys uh, where needed, and this was very important uh, as it um, helps us in our, our, our future work with regards to data collection. Now, the Ridgecrest earthquake was kind of an ideal, ideal event because it occurred in a place with low population density, um, there was little to no vegetation, and there was relatively easy access if you just forget the massive 
Rhode Island sized Navy base that was over there. Um, so other than that, things were relatively good. Now these circumstances allow for the gear team to collect quite a bit of information. So what you see there on the map there is uh, the magnitude 6.4 rupture, a uh, surface rupture that essentially crossed the California 170, uh, 178. And if you see the purple lines over there, as it says on the map, are GPS tracked surface fault ruptures in those locations. And the green line were transects that we measure crack widths. Um, and then the yellow line was a footprint of the buried pipeline that serviced water into the towns of Trona to the east. Uh, the, red, the red area you see there uh, is essentially repair work that was done to fix the damages that are shown as stars along where those uh, surface fault ruptures crossed the pipeline. So that was pretty cool. Um, now, we were able to get even more data and we were able to capture detailed failure in the mechanisms of these pipes that would be absolutely impossible to get had this occurred in an urban, urban area for many reasons that I will not elaborate on right now. Um, and then the, we, you know, we were able to capture these even before they were fixed. Again, I said they, these people are pretty fast. They had to fix the water because the water had to be supplied to the city of Trona. So we were able to capture this. We were also able to ca see fault rupture across a pg and &E pipeline. Um, but even after further excavation, we saw that there was no damage. So these, this data that we're collecting gives us a, a, a very good database to capture the impacts of uh, ground displacements demands on these different infrastructures regards to the amount and the fragilities of these structures. So it also serves as good data for people who want to perform surface, uh, fault, uh, surface rupture modeling regards to probability and amounts. So that was pretty good, and we've collected all this data. Now, in addition to that, I know we're geotech, so I'm going to, I'm going to touch on it very quickly. We also captured a lot of liquefaction features uh, in the towns of Trona and Argus, which were to, to the east of the rupture. Um, now, these two towns, uh, are sitting on top of quaternary alluvial and lacustrine deposits uh, that are fine to coarse grain um, in, uh, in, in size, sediment size. But in some of these areas, they have cementation that occur due to, from minerals and salts. Uh, as you, as if you guys are not familiar, this area is a very huge mining area for uh, like a borate and all these kind of things that are used, different elements. So because of the, the, the geology underneath, we were able to observe a lot of ground failures here and also cases where there were no failures. Uh, sand boils are typical, you know, you got to get those pictures in. Um, we had a lot of uh, compressional features from lateral spreading and also extensional features from lateral spreading as well as things, there were a lot of complex ground motions that happened here. And even more so, if you go into the lake area, there were areas where these sand boils also have the, uh, the salt crystals and the minerals that percolated to the top. So these, is very, these are very interesting features that we can, we can look at. Even in, and in addition, we also have, were able to get like multi-epoch events on structures. So here you see a building in Trona, a restaurant that was damaged on July 4th by the magnitude 6.4 earthquake that was further damaged by the magnitude 7.1. And you can see that by the you know, wider crack and then sand boil coming out, uh, as, uh, ejector coming out from, um, from the crack. So that was very interesting. All this data is great and we essentially could use these as case histories for liquefaction case histories, lateral spreading and ground oscillation case histories, and the uh, liquefaction effects on structures. So there, we've gathered all this data done a lot of the work, and we've essentially compiled it and placed it on open source and on Next Generation Liquefaction website, and also on DesignSafe, the NERI website, so that we can, anybody can access it with a DOI. Now, with regards to ground motions, uh, there were a lot of stations that recorded the events due to the size, but also there were a lot of uh, stations close by to these, this event. Um, so that allows us to capture a lot of near-field data, which we desperately need for a lot of stuff. Um, and even with that, there were more stations deployed for, as temporary stations by USGS and a few other organizations to capture aftershocks. So the wealth of data has, is, continues to grow. Uh, we've compiled the metadata, we've processed the data according to peer re, uh, procedures, and we're essentially you know, running the analysis. Now, if we look at the ground motion, the attenuation of this particular events, um, on the left side, on the left three panels of the magnitude 6.4, and the right side is the magnitude 7.1, and we compare these to the NGA West 2, the ground motion models, uh, we see that the attenuation is pretty good. Uh, it's minimal bias, so that's a good sign in regards to how we're modeling stuff. But you can clearly see there's a, a clear side effect that we have to account for and adjust for where all the green sites are kind of above the median on average. So these are things that we, get, we have to look at and these are things that are exciting to us. In addition, we also see uh, forward and backward directivity effects because um, of the stations that were, uh, as how they were placed in the earthquake. This is primarily from the 7.1. And that's also pretty interesting as well. We were also able to see that from the ground station in, in, in Ridgecrest, which is 
or, or, or the, to the west, that the, the structures were shaken at code, ne code level design, uh, design code level um, ground motion. So that's actually very interesting because the city of Richcrest, Richcrest didn't see much structural damage in comparison to Trona and Argus. But there are many reasons about that that I won't speak about. Uh, we also captured a lot of aerial imagery. Um, we had a team that went out and included JPL, University of Washington, and the UCLA group that captured a lot of drone images that were, uh, for the surface fault ruptures and the, and the liquefaction features that we were able to use to create structural motion products that help us in our reconnaissance, that we don't have to do reconnaissance on the field. We can delay it and do it in, our, in, in, our, in the office. And then USGS has a wealth of LIDAR data for the entire surface rupture, which essentially increases in, um, in resolution as you get closer and closer in. Uh, so this is great, and it's, uh, it's available on opentopography.com once you get uh, access. Now, in summary, essentially, we were able to collect a rich data set on fault rupture. We have a lot of information that we still have to sift through. There's a lot of things that we can do. There's a lot of pipeline crosses within the base that we still have to essentially review. You didn't hear that from me. Um, and then we have a few but significant case histories of pipeline performance. Um, again, the base has more, but you didn't hear it from me. Um, and we have many case histories on liquefaction and non-liquefaction events, and we're in the process of getting a geotechnical uh, site data to essentially run site response analysis and then further our research and see if we can back analyze a lot of these states. Um, in addition, we have a lot, we also use a lot of INSAR uh, to, as deployment, as to helping our deployment, so that's been really great and helpful. And then we also, again, the data, the ground motion database has grown, so we can do a lot more work. So in, in overview, um, I wanted to say that we're very lucky uh, as people who live particularly in Southern California and LA area, because this, this is a, we kind of dodged the bullet. Had this event occurred 200 kilometers to the south in the heart of LA, let's say the Newport Ingle Fault and the Santa Monica Fault, we would be having a different conversation and I probably wouldn't be here because my house is about a thousand feet from the Newport Ingle Fault. So that would have kind of sucked. Um, maybe it would have been fun, but this was a little bit too big to take the risk. Um, also, um, just so you know, we've. We have some papers that further detail this information. So um, look out for these papers in the BSSA, the Bulletin uh, Seismological Society of America, of America. And we have some papers on liquefaction that detail a lot more of the events that we, think, that we did and then um, on, on ground motions and fault rupture. Uh, so thank you, guys. Appreciate it.